Went in. Hey there, how you doing? <laughs> doing good. good How's to it going, see you, James? Buddy. Oh wow, look at this. Holy smokes, man. This is absolutely beautiful. Wow. Great job, Mark. This thank is you. Absolutely great. I gotta thank you for actually uh even proposing this because it lit a fire under my ass to actually finish this thing. Oh yeah. It sat here for so long. Yeah. It, would have, it was just gunnel, stem, keel, and frames. Yeah. And I had the planking stock already cut already. Yeah. <laughs> and I just had to freaking put in some time to actually finish <laughs> it up, you know? Well, it's absolutely beautiful, man. Thank really you. well done. Ah, come on been wanting some boat building videos. <laughs> I've had a bunch of you say, where's the boat building? Okay, well, we'll do a little bit of boat building today. Not a lot, but a little bit. somewhere around I think 2010 or 2011. I think it was even a bit earlier actually. I met a friend. No, we got to rewind a bit. I used to have a shop set up uh, in Vancouver. While I was there, I got offered to take part in sort of a group exhibition. The local university, uh, Simon Fraser University, was doing an expansion and they were cutting down a bunch of trees. Somebody got it into their heads that it would be a good idea to take the trees, mill them up, and then give them to a bunch of artists to uh, do something with, called the Two Trees Project. So there was a cedar tree and a maple tree, and I went, okay, sure. And uh, I didn't know what I was gonna do at all. In the end, I decided to build an invaluate kayak, which is just like this one here. So this is not my first one. And at the time, I didn't have all the construction details related to that particular boat sorted out. I did my best with what I knew, and um, I generated a boat that it looks just fine, I think. And it went on, on to an exhibition in Vancouver. It got picked up by a provincial government organization that does marketing for BC forest products around the world, Japan and Europe and stuff like that, as part of a, a, pro, a, a sort of a showcase at, at trade shows. It actually eventually went on to being shown at the uh, Vancouver Olympics when it was there in, in sort of the BC pavilion. So it's kind of a cool story for this one particular uh, boat frame. Step ahead a couple of years, I get a contract to build some boats for the Vancouver airport for a display. And so I chose a canoe and a Inuvialuit kayak. Now I will use the term Inuvialuit and Inuvialuit interchangeably. Uh, mostly Inuvialuit is the casual way to, to say the name because it's a hard name to say. So this is a kayak from the Mackenzie River Delta area. And the main city around there is Inuvik. So, I met a guy who uh, grew up here in Victoria. His name was Kevin Floyd. He was moving up to Inuvik to rediscover his roots, to meet his family. He was adopted as a kid. At the moment that I met him, he had just recently found out that he was actually Inuvialuit himself. He had no idea. He uh, went and did a little search for himself and found out his parents were from the Inuvik region and they're both Inuvialuit. And um, this was about the same time that I met him and I said, you know what? I just built an Inuvialuit kayak. Take a look at the one I built. It's over in my backyard. If I'm not around, go ahead and have a peek. We got to be friends. And at some point, he invited me to come up to Inuvik to build one of these kayaks up there at the Great Northern Arts Festival. So I actually prefabbed parts of a kayak, put it together in a bundle, stuffed it all into a backpack with a handful of tools, jumped on a plane, flew up to Inuvik, and went to this arts festival and set up shop there and finished building the kayak. The festival invited me back up again for the next year, and Kevin and I together taught a class for a bunch of youth on how to build Inuvialuit kayaks. We built about five kayaks while we were there at the festival. By the time I got home, I had sort of learned a bunch more about building Inuvialuit kayaks. I wanted to explore it a bit more. And so that's when I started building this one on spec. I had figured out some of the joinery while I was in Inuvik and I uh, wanted to keep pushing that forward. And 
So here we are. I got this far. I've used this kayak for display or for presentation purposes uh, at various boat shows over the years. And it's just been rolling around on the rafters. Well, right now, I've got a friend who's up in Ucluid who's starting a little kayak museum. And he needs some stuff for display. So I'm going to finish this off. It's going to go up to him. Maybe it'll be for sale or just on display or whatever. Anyhow, so uh, I don't have a lot to do. I need to peg some of these ribs in place because they're all a bit floppy and hanging loose. I need to put the hull stringers on. I think I've already got a cockpit hoop made up. I have to go looking in the back. I hope I do. And um, and we got to do some deck stringers. The Innovella kayaks are kind of very unique compared to all the rest. Most other Arctic kayaks have stringers that are made up of something that's close to one by ones. In a Valet kayak has stringers that are almost like planks. I don't know why that is. I think they have a lot more material resources around the Inuvik area because the Mackenzie River is running through there. They've got trees that get washed up the river. And of course they have trees growing along there because that's one part of the Arctic that still has, has foliage. It's not all rocks. The Innovalet kayaks are also interesting in their use of a grown crook for a stem. The preferred material for birch trees that are hanging out over the river and of course creating sort of a grown crook. Most kayaks are built starting with the gunnels, springing those into a kayak shape and then building a kayak around that. The anecdotal story I've received about Innovalet kayaks is that they start building from the keel first. I've been struggling to try and figure out exactly what that means in practical purposes, how one would actually go about doing that. And I think what they mean when they say keel first is that you're starting by looking for your stems, that you don't necessarily start building the keel first, but you, the first thing you look for is, is our suitable stems, which of course, makes up the, uh, the backbone of the boat. And once you find those, you're off the races. I'm just gonna hit this with a backing out plane to kind of round out the inside a bit, make it look a bit better. If you're gonna be a boat builder, at some point you're gonna need a backing out plane. Mostly we use backing out planes in Carvel construction. That's when you have planks butted edge to edge and then cocked in between, smooth skinned inside and out. And on hulls that have got a lot of shape, um, when the planks are, don't, sometimes the planks need to get a, a concave cut onto your inside face to match up with the frames. The way I use it is I just kind of pile myself down the middle of this plank here. I'm not trying to get the whole plank to conform to the sh exact shape of the plane. Don't worry about that. Carving a trough and then I sort of work up the sides of the trough. And I like working backwards. I just I find it uh, more comfortable for me for this particular plane. Now that I've got that done, what I want to do is shape the outside of this little plank or stringer. Technically they're stringers, but we'll call them planks. So what I'm doing is I'm just letting my plane ride on the bench and uh, take up an angle to sort of just kind of bevel off this top of this plank a little bit. These videos are sponsored by viewers like you. If you'd like to help support these videos, you can do so by making monthly pledges on Patreon or one-time donations through PayPal. You can find links in the description or up in the corner. And 
that's as fussy as I need to get with that one. This one's going to get a slightly different treatment. And on the other side, what we're going to do is we're going to take down the, uh, the back side of it a little piece. There we go. That's good enough. So what we get is something that's closer to my traditional style scarf, where you take the feather edge, and instead of it coming to a complete feather off the back side, you leave a little bit of meat on the front side and you bevel that off and that keeps this edge from rising up. And for this particular bit of construction, that's perfectly fine. Uh, it's not, doesn't give you the smoothest result this way. You wouldn't necessarily use this if you're trying to make a, a, an invisible scarf, but uh, for traditional construction, that's the standard. And often you'd have nails or something like that. We're gonna sew this together. And when I built one of these up in Inuvik the first time, I used a traditional bow drill for the entire project. It was a great way to hone in on my drilling skills, my bow drill skills. It certainly left me with a very painful job by the end of the, the week's activities. I'll tell you one thing though, working with the traditional tools was key to giving me insight. Now, of course, my tools weren't 100% traditional in that they're, you know, I'm using a knife. Which is obviously modern and the bow drill is mostly traditional except you know it's got steel steel bits in it instead of bone or antler bits or ivory but um, that's not the point the point is by forcing myself to work with just the hand tools i was able to develop an understanding of this gunnel joinery the deck beam to gunnel joinery, which I hadn't figured out before. Um, I mean, these fe featured mortise and tendon joints when I looked at drawings, but it wasn't until I sort of got into it, I was able to deduce that there it's a tapered mortise. So on the outside, is it's about a quarter inch wide. On the inside, it's, it's the full width of the deck beam. Why that's significant is if you're just working with a bow drill and a knife, you drill a couple of holes, you connect those dots with a knife to make a little slot, and then to make it bigger, you just whittle it out on the inside and, and it works out such that you can do that quite easily with just a knife. So it's when I discovered that, that I sort of, you know, I had that aha moment, like why they have these tapered mortises. It's not, it doesn't make it more complicated. It actually makes it less complicated. To the uh, uninformed eye, it looks more complicated. The very first one of these I built, I tried, I did full on, you know, square mortises. And, and what I found doing that is like to do these square mortises in, in a boat that's got, um, but it's got these angles everywhere. They, they were really tricky to do. But the tapered ones, cakewalk, and you can adjust them really easily too. You can adjust the length of your deck beams really easily just by whittling down the ends of those deck beams some more. And it's cause it's just a tapered end. It's very fast to do with a knife. All right, now we need to drill holes on these stringers, about a half inch from the corners, one high, one low, one on one side of the rib, one on the other side, and we use a running lashing. Now to cut my notches in these, I was playing around with different ways to do it. And one way I was messing around with this, just using this V gouge and using my ruler as a guide. That works actually pretty good. start this knot off, we just we start by putting a ball on the end of our line here. Come around our rib, around the standing part. And with the bitter end, we just do a single overhand knot. We snug that down, pull it tight until that balled up end is tight on the end. If you don't do that, if you don't have that balled up end, this line usually just slips its knots very easily. 
or the first lashing, doesn't really matter how you do it because it's the static end. I usually just go through, go around through there and then I'll, uh, I'll loop the whole knot. So I've got a knot on the end of the rib. It's coming through the hole, through the hole, coming around the rib right now. And I'm just gonna come around like so, just loop that whole thing. Okay, now we've got some tension on it. We come around the back of this rib through the top hole. Through the bottom hole. And then we come back through here and over top. And in doing that, it passes over the line that comes from there to there. Puts a little tension on it as we snug this forward. So it kind of, it pinches it. And now it's under some tension. I can let go of this and this is now tight on the inside and we continue like that. This hooked stem, which is made usually made from a grown crook. I've laminated mine because grown crooks are not so easy for me to get my hands on. They've got a uh, like a V notch on the inside, and the stringers and the gunnels just tuck tuck into that V notch and are lashed to one side of the notch. I'm not using a needle here because it's tight quarters inside here. The uh, the needle would just hit the inside of the stem. So I'm just going to feed it through by hand. Now here's a trick. It's not going to feed through on its own because I've already went, gone through once. So I bundle it up with the, uh, the existing one that's passing through as best I can. You can see, we just, uh, the end of this is just left long. We flatten it out a little bit to fit into that notch and then we just lash it in place. Old sanding belts. These make really good backing bands for bending. Okay, um, I'm gonna start this bend here. I've never tried this. I've never tried mounting one of my molds to the side of the bench like this. I've used a piece of, um, sanding belt as a backing band for before I did that for my um, banjo making jig and it worked really well which is why I'm going to give it a shot and I have a feeling that I can possibly not clamp it to start with because the backing band in theory should do that for me so we shall see so I've had this in here for 15 minutes I'm just going to slide it out and give it a feel see if we're supple enough may go a little longer because it wasn't soaking for super long, just overnight. Ooh, that feels good. Okay, so into there, good. And, ouch. Okay, that's hard on the hands. It's mostly working pretty Good, come on. Okay, not too shabby. All right, let's see. I need a little assistance here. Mm. Ah, weak left hand, weak left hand. Not terrible. That makes a lot more sense than my setups in the past. 
Don't know why I never thought about this before. Under, over, under, over, then under the string here. Pull down, being careful not to slice your fingers off by uh, grabbing it like this, underhanded, you always go underhanded. Come up, and you don't have to worry too much about hanging onto the tension, because when you pull it down here, it's going to tighten up. This is, it's almost exactly the same as the way the other knot goes, works. Under, over, under, over, under. Tighten. Keep going. One part that's really unique to these Inuvialuit kayaks, I call it the clenching rail. <laughs> and it's basically a stiffening member because these boats are so lightly flanked. It needs something to sort of stiffen it up in here a bit more. And so this, that's what this does. It just it gives you a backbone that you park your butt on and clench onto, I guess, because of the generally very round nature of these boats. detail cockpit hoop now <laughs> this is brand new but it looks about a million years old and that's partially because I uh, gave this thing a coat of this product which is like an enzyme that essentially oxidizes the wood prematurely and it works uh, specifically well on on any species of wood that has a lot of tannins in it this is black locust which is fairly tannic wood just like oak and it works really well on sapili mahogany the locust I had had some stains on it anyway, from iron stains, from some junk that got into my soaking tank. I didn't really like the way that looked, and I just wanted to sort of make the whole thing look a little crustier. I think it just adds a bit of character to it. What I really am trying to do with the space is make it a, a place of stories. So yeah. when you walk in, it's like a giant storybook. Yeah. All of the pieces that I'm bringing in, I'm trying to get all the back history and the stories of those particular builds. Some of the builds, they've documented everything. They've got like all of the sketches, yeah. they've got everything. It's a space that will continue to grow with time, right? Like museums do. 
all of the little pieces that are all over the place are all everything has a story yeah. and and so does the place itself right yeah. like the building has huge history and mm -hmm. people come in they're like tell me about the building yeah, like, i want to know about the building yeah, yeah. and the wreckage itself was constructed about 50 years ago the wreckage is actually all built with found materials and driftwood. It's just the most unique place, but the, what I really enjoy about the space is just the heartbeat to the place. Like yeah. you you walk into this building and yeah. you can just feel the vibe. It's got a good vibe. You, yeah. It just yeah. has yeah. this amazing vibe. You walk in and you're like, wow, I, yeah. can just, I can feel the heartbeat to this building. Yeah. And once that door opens, it's going to expose traditional kayaking and kayaks in general to people that may have yeah. never had the opportunity to see some of this stuff before, right? It's, it's really going to be a special place. And what it will be, will be a kayak hub. It'll be a kayak hub and museum and a place of stories, you know, it really is what it is. Oh, it's light. Yeah. 20 pounds. I was going to say, this this got to weigh about 20 pounds. Very cool. I whack that on virtually everything. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've never moved it without whacking it. Very excited. <laughs> Now I'm so relieved to finally get that project done. Now, as I look at my model, I notice a couple of things. Firstly, I make a point of trying to get these models detailed fairly accurately. And I noticed that I should have actually drilled my deck stringers out for that lashing. And I also noticed that my hull stringers should have been lashed every other rib, and that would have saved me a whole bunch of time. There's one other detail I noticed, and that's that I forgot to put the clenching rail into this model. And so I'm going to take advantage of the fact that I got the ball rolling on Unavalo kayak construction and I'm going to put this rail in right now. And while the full-size boat is going to go out and go to James and hang on the wall in his museum, I still have my model to hang on my wall and enjoy remembering the process. So if you enjoyed that and you want to learn a little bit more about Arctic culture, watch my video here on building model Comete. Those are dog sleds. And if you can help support these videos, I really appreciate that. You can do that by joining me on Patreon. And there's a link in the corner or down in the description. Until next time, don't get your sticks in a twist.